Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Welcome back for season 12 of the podcast. A quick note for listeners, I'm experimenting with shorter episodes this season. I hope that'll leave you wanting more, but either way, let me know what you think. Today, we're talking about the 94th Oscars, specifically the Academy's decision to pre-record eight of the 23 awards during the hour preceding the live broadcast, and then air edited segments during the ceremony itself. My first guest is set decorator Rena D'Angelo. Rena, you're a two-time Oscar nominee, this year for your work on West Side Story, and previously for 2016's Bridge of Spies. Welcome to Below the Line. Thank you. Also with us is writer slash director slash editor Christopher Angel, who most recently joined us to discuss the nominees for film editing as part of Below the Line's Oscar series, which just concluded. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Now, listeners, if you're someone who has DVR'd the Oscar ceremony but haven't gotten around to watching it, you should consider this a spoiler warning. For everyone else, I think you kind of know what happened, but let's talk about the timeline of the Oscars themselves. Nominees were announced on February 8th, and that kicks off what we call award season for the Oscars, right? Where there's a lot of interviews and publicity and just sort of discussing the films that are on the list. Now, on February 22nd, the Academy announced that they were going to do a new format this year. And as we discussed, they were going to pre-record certain awards. It wouldn't be part of the live ceremony, which, of course, as folks may know, was scheduled for March 17th. So, Rena, kick us off. Talk to me about the awards season and how it was different this year than, like, say, 2016. Well, it was the same up until the time that they told us there was a logistics meeting that they wanted to have via Zoom. And we all tuned in thinking it was probably going to be about COVID restrictions. And and we realized as he was talking that he, he was telling us he was going to pre-record eight of the categories to save time on the show because they were trying to keep it at a three hour maximum. And by cutting our categories, which they said they would just cut the walk up to the stage and the unfolding of the paper and just leave the, pretty much leave the speeches as they were, but maybe cut the ums. And if people were stuttering, they would cut that out. So we were all kind of caught by surprise by this news. And as they explained it further to us, everybody was kind of sitting in stunned silence trying to process it and then started asking questions. So the meeting went on for quite some time. And needless to say, everybody was really disappointed, felt a bit disrespected by it. We wanted to know how they chose these eight categories. Was it a random choice? It was funny that they all happened to be below the line. And um, I don't know. We So we just, the meeting went on and then I started getting phone calls from other nominees. And then I started talking, I talked to a governor from the Academy and asked her, what was this all about? And she said that they didn't even know about it. And it was something that the producers had decided to do in order to keep, to get more entertainment value into the show and to keep it at three hours. So that put a damper because the nomination is the greatest thing. I mean, it's the pinnacle of, of your career. You get nominated for an Oscar and it's it's a really great fun day. People call and congratulate you. You start doing a lot of press and it's it's fun. We were all on a high until that moment. And then it was just like, you're invited, but you're sitting at the kids table. So yeah, so, the, so after that award season was a little bit different and it was all anybody could talk about. We talked about it constantly. We talked about it with people in the press. We talked about it with other people who were nominated. We talked about it with people who weren't nominated, who were in the business. It's all anybody wanted to talk about because the Academy is inclusive of all the crafts. And it's the first time, you know, it's the only award show where we are honored the same as the actors and the directors are. And we felt slighted and Rosie, sorry. <laughs> There's a cat. There's, There's a, a cat. cat. <laughs> Wants to be in the podcast. <laughs> she likes to get in on the Zooms. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, it just, it changed the dynamic of all of it because as much as we were still happy to be nominated, it didn't have the same feeling as it had the year before. And for some reason, we didn't really believe that they weren't going to really edit down the speeches to almost nothing because... And we really didn't know what the how they were going to do it. We were trying to figure it out the whole time. And that's, you know, for later, but it wasn't what we thought it 
I mean, we kind of had a feeling it was going to be bad, but we didn't realize it was going to be quite as inelegant as it as it turned out to be. And Rena, if I can bring you back to that meeting, you know, where somebody's asking, how did you choose these eight categories? Do you remember what they told you? They said it was random. It was randomly chosen. I mean, I, they said they chose them just randomly and every year they were going to do it like this and they were going to pick new categories to do it with. And somebody said, oh, is, so is Best Supporting Actor going to be one of them next year? And <laughs> they <laughs> obviously that's not going to happen because costumes wasn't chosen and visual effects wasn't chosen but they said well they'll have their chance next year to be, but they won't probably i don't know if they're going to do this again there was so much backlash that we thought there was a chance they were going to reverse it but they were too far down the line to and they are so beholden to abc at this point because they give them a certain amount of money every year and they are half they all they explained it to us but it didn't really change the fact that we felt like we were being demoted and the backlash is continuing here today on our podcast. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We just yeah. can't stop talking about it. Exactly. Well, it was interesting because the Academy did respond to the backlash well before the ceremony, but they responded with assurances, public assurances, basically what they had given you on that meeting. Again, that they were going to handle it with respect, that everyone was still going to get their moment, that it really was for the show. But Chris, what was your take on what they said they were going to do and kind of what people were hoping they would do, what they might do? Yeah, well, see, you may remember when we were sort of in the run up to our episode on uh, the editing nominees that I was already really up in arms about this decision as well and really upset. And I just didn't see from an edit editing point of view how they could possibly do this without coming across as disrespecting these categories. I mean, I knew that their motivation was to try to save time, right? They were trying to get this thing under three hours and keep the show moving. But I knew that that meant as an editor that they were going to have to cut out significant portions of things that I love about the ceremony. There's, there was no other way to do it. So, you know, I, I knew sort of from the beginning that this was not something that I was really going to be very happy with. And I didn't see, given what they were saying, how this was going to turn out well. Well, I'll admit that I was in the wait and see camp. Like I thought, this is bad. But you would think that if there was a way to do it well, like this is the group of folks that would figure it out. Like somebody would come up with something creative that worked and, you know, satisfied all masters. We're going to get to what they actually ended up doing in a bit. Let's go back to that hour itself. Rena, what was that hour like? Well, they had us come early. They wanted us to come super early. And I didn't see any reason for that because they were already seating us an hour before everybody else. So we got there at probably around 2.30 and we walked the red carpet with hardly anybody on it and got up to the bar and we started going in around 3.30, quarter to four. And there was a lot of people going in. I mean, Steven Spielberg, for one, like he told us he was gonna go to sit in solidarity with us. We knew Jessica Chastain was gonna be there. The rest of the directors came, Guillermo and uh, Denis was there. And there was a good amount of people, but there was still a lot of people on the red carpet because their screens were up. We could still see people coming in. There was seat fillers, of course. So the show went on and they started in Josh Brolin and um, Jason. Jason Momoa. Momoa, that, yeah, him. They, the, from Dune, they were handing out the, the awards for us. So they did, you know, a bit. They announced sound and they did, you know, they did the whole preamble. They did a whole sound is when blah, blah, you know, they, they did what they do. They, they announced sound. They announced each category with a good preamble up to it. And then they said the winner and the winner got up on stage. The first bad thing that happened was there was four sound guys from Dune and the three gave their speeches and then the fourth one started giving his speech and they played the music off. Then they did it with everybody else and everybody gave great speeches and, you know, used their 45 seconds. And then after 40 minutes, we all got up and went back out to the bar. And then they tried to rush everybody back in for the beginning of the ceremony, which was <laughs> not going well. Because we were like, how in the world are they going to get all these people back into the theater? And then the show began and we watched the sound first one that was pre-recorded and we were all sort of like, okay, that wasn't what they promised. And then it just got worse from there. But the hour that we were in there alone, it, it was great because it was just like awards and speeches and funny banter and it was great, but we knew what was coming. We knew it was gonna be, they were gonna edit it down. So they made an effort to recreate the awards experience yes. they weren't just treating it like 
background and trying to capture what they needed for the ceremony. No, they, no, no. It was it was an awards experience. And, you know, if it was part of the regular show, it would have been great. It was just prior and everybody was excited and cheering and congratulating each other. And it was just like the regular show. And then it was over. And then we then then we knew we lost or won, depending on who you were. And the rest of the show you had now you had three and a half more hours where you're going to sit there without the anticipation of when is my category coming up. You're just like, I didn't win or I won or I won if I won and I'm at the bar, you know, because all the winners are not going to sit and watch the rest of the show. So it started out OK and then it ended really badly, I think. You know, I mean, Chris, you saw it. You saw how they edited it. It was just. Not good. I mean, the the easy joke that I want to make, uh, the low low hanging fruit here, is that if, you know they couldn't find any good editors to come and edit this <laughs> thing down because nobody wanted to do the dirty deed. Exactly. So, it was not. It was not well done. I mean, there were two things like you know, for me watching this from home and you know actually watching a lot of it after the fact. Like there were two things that happened that weren't good from my point of view. One is that there were people in there, obviously on Twitter, who were keeping track of the below the line categories and who was winning. You know, for me, usually following along at home, I might have a favorite movie that I'm I'm sort of pulling for, but suddenly like a lot of the math had kind of gone out of it by the time the live broadcast had gone on because we knew the Dune was ahead just in, in sheer numbers. So that normal sense of anticipation and uh, mystery was kind of gone. So watching that the ceremony at home was not pleasant because I missed the human aspect of seeing the different nominees in each category. And when you sort of getting to see real people and sort of seeing their reaction when their friend wins or they don't win, they do win. It was over before I even could wonder who was going to win the category. It's sudden, you know, they just cut to the person on stage. Um, and then the biggest issue, of course, is how they did cut down the speeches, which they said they weren't going to do. But, they did. you know, they didn't do a very elegant job editorially of cutting out the speeches. And that was too bad because there were things lost. And you, you can find the, you know, the full speeches on Twitter people did record them from inside the theater and put them on Twitter. So you can sort of compare uh, what's on the broadcast versus what was actually done in that hour before the live broadcast. And it's a shame that things were lost. A lot of things were lost because there were some really wonderful speeches made and, and they cut them up to the point where they almost didn't make any sense. The woman who won for hair and makeup, her speech was wonderful and it was long and they pretty much boiled it down to like thanking Jessica Chastain so they could get a picture of a movie star in there. I mean, it, it was really painful to watch. And as the show progressed and we kept seeing more of these, our entire section, which was all pre-recorded, the joy was sucked out of the room. There was no joy left. We just, it, we couldn't have any enthusiasm for it because we knew the results and we were watching how they treated the people that they said they were going to treat respectfully. Going back to it's uh, Linda Dowds who won uh, for hair and makeup for the eyes of Tammy Faye and her speech, her full speech is really interesting to look at. It's one of the ones I got to see on Twitter because what she does talk about that they cut out are the other below the line people. It's just, it doesn't, it's not a good look when that's what's being cut out. It's sort of, you know, thanking the thousands of below the line workers who make movies happen, you know, when, we're being cut out of the speeches like that doesn't seem very good it, it sort of points to this as like you know not respecting the below the line people properly yeah. yeah and then the other one of course i have to give a shout out to is joe walker who I, I really liked his editing and since i came and spoke about editing before he edited dune but there's again this like crazy irony that his speech was kind of cut in a way that garbled it and it didn't totally makes sense and it was really funny when you watch the whole thing yeah. he's sort of talking about his family and his teenage daughter and how they rib him for his work and it's just, it's a very human moment it's the sort of stuff that i like to see in the oscars telecasts because you get a sense of like these are real people who have lives and sacrifice quite a bit to make these movies and they just sort of cut it out and he's the editor and it just was poorly edited so again very strange and ironic in a sense that was the one that I think bothered me because his speech was funny and it wasn't boring and it didn't need to be edited. And w the way they did it, they kind of let him say three things and then cut the middle part out and then brought it to the one line where he said, my daughter, my my 17 year old daughter called my Oscar nominee and now he's validated, but they didn't play it all the way through. So when you heard it edited, it didn't make any sense. That one was really upsetting because they did exactly what they said they weren't going to do. I hope that they see the error of their ways of what they did this year. And I understand their need to try and bring in this mythical audience that they think that they can get that doesn't actually exist. 
<laughs> right. That watches Spider Man <laughs> and also watches Power of the Dog and thinks it should be best picture. And you know, I I just don't know that this is this is not an attainable audience. These are kids who are never going to watch the Oscars. They're not interested. And a lot of adults aren't interested in the Oscars. It's us. We all care about the Oscars. But trying to get that audience by cutting out what most people watch the Oscars for is alienating the audience that you that has stayed with you for all these years. And And it didn't gain them anything. And I think they really, really lost a lot of viewers. I know a lot of people who've watched the Oscars their entire lives, they were mad and they were just like, what was that? I don't know that if this is what it's going to be next year, I don't know that I want to watch it. I'm one of those people, honestly. I am too. I was yeah. there and I'm one of those people. Right. And I, you know, I did the podcast. I mean, I, I owe a lot to the Academy. You know, I, I won a student Academy award and this forgot my career going. And I'm a, me- you know, I'm a member of the museum. Like I just, I'm a cinephile. I love movies yeah. and I watch yeah. it every year, but I just, I was so angry, Skid, as you know, that I did not watch it live this year. I went out to dinner with my family, um, which was very nice and quiet on the West side of LA uh, when, when they can do that. But, you know, I watched it later streaming on Hulu so that I could kind of just go quickly through it, knowing that I was going to be upset. And yeah. I was. Yeah, no, I just, I have always loved the Academy Awards. I'm in the Academy. I love being in the Academy. I just, I, I, this year was just, it just, there just something turned in a way that I don't know how they're going to recover from it unless they go back and somehow start over, rethink everything that they did, turn it back into a dinner that isn't televised so they don't have to worry about the bro- the ad space and the revenue but this was just it was it 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 wasn't just disappointing to the nominees it was disappointing to everybody in the business everybody was collectively hurt and felt disrespected by it and Rena, you you brought up an interesting point earlier that i hadn't given a lot of thought and that's yes recognizing the impossibility of pleasing both this broadcast audience, again, this mythical audience, I like the way you said that, and the people that work in films that we're actually trying to recognize. But the role of ABC in the television influence and sort of the, that's not something I've given a lot of thought as far as how that relationship has pulled things in a certain direction. Honestly, the producers of the show don't necessarily even care that much about the awards in the sense they're trying to score numbers on the I mean, awards. That's itself. what it boils down to. And and the problem, another problem with that, is that so many people don't have broadcast TV anymore. People have canceled their canceled their cable. They're watching it later on on Hulu or they're watching it on their computers. People aren't watching broadcast television as much as they used to. Like I haven't. I don't know when the last time I put ABC on to watch something. If they had it on a streaming station, I think they might get a bigger audience and then people could pay if they want to watch it and they could get their revenue that way. I don't know. I'm not in charge, but I just, there's got to be, a, they have to rethink it because what they did this year just didn't work. It, it didn't appeal to anybody. It didn't appeal to the audience they were trying to get. It didn't appeal to the audience they've always had. And they made a lot of Academy members very unhappy at the same time. And you could really see it in the broadcast. I mean, it was really kind of all over the place at times. You know, they were teasing the upcoming actors, the famous actors who were going to be appearing in, in upcoming segments. So they were really trying to push the sort of fame aspect of it, which is something that you just always assumed previously was going to be at the Oscars. Like that, I mean, I would tune in. I wouldn't need to be told that these actors are coming up to, to sort of stay tuned. So something something had turned. Um, and, and I think the bigger significance of what's going on also is worth talking about, right? So... Raina, what you're talking about, you know, with streaming versus live TV, and then also with the theatrical movie experience, we're obviously at a very strange moment in America with how people consume media and consume television and film. And the pandemic has not helped because people have gotten out of the habit of going to movies in a sense. And then also very famously, like a lot of people go to the movies to see a very big Marvel movie or comic book movie. And the smaller movies that might be doing better at the Oscars, not as many people are going right now uh, to see those in the cinema and streaming is taking over. So in in a weird way, what's happening to the Oscars is reflective of what's happening to the industry more broadly. And it's this push pull between like, well, what what does a theatrical movie even represent right now? And, you know, where is the talent actually working and how do we make this all work? It's, It's sort of a bigger issue in society. 
Yeah. And also, historically, the Academy Awards have been for a certain caliber of film. They're not big blockbuster movies. I mean, when they decided to make 10 categories for Best Picture, I think that was after one of the Batmans, right? That didn't get a nomination and everybody was very upset about it. So they decided to give those big movies a chance. They made it up to 10 categories, could be Best Picture. And then when it still didn't get in, uh, then all these other movies that aren't really the best movies of the year start getting nominated. They want to see Spider-Man get nominated for an Oscar. Um, they want to see, I don't know what these other movies are, but the ones that are making billions of dollars get in there and they're not getting in there and they're trying to make it inclusive of those types of movies. But that's not what the Academy Awards is. The Academy Awards is not what movie made the most money. It's what was the best film of the year with the best score and the best production design and the best acting and the best, you know, the whole picture. And it's apples and oranges. Spider-Man and Power of the Dog are two completely different movies that don't belong in the same. They don't go head to head. There is no head to head comparison between those films. And they tried, they tried, you know, they had this like fan favorite top five moments. Which was ridiculous. Yeah, Yeah, it was really silly. And I don't even remember who that was one of the moments we were we were in the audience watching this. And we're all looking at the screen saying, I've never even heard of any of these movies. And what does it have to do with the Oscars? And because they're going to say the name of that, whatever that I don't even know what the one that won the best movie war war of (laughs) Army of the Dead, I think Army of the Dead. 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 Yeah, Netflix. So we all just that. looked at each other and just said, <laughs> what does this have to do with anything that has to do with the Academy Awards? It just seems strange. And it was another reason why we got bumped, because that's more entertaining to people that are not watching the show. So on the on the topic of sort of the bigger significance of the Oscars and sort of what it means culturally, there's a op-ed in the New York Times I kind of want to point our listeners to. They can sort of read at their leisure, but it's by Ross Douthat. Um, and the headline is, we aren't just watching the decline of the Oscars, we're watching the end of movies. And he's basically saying that what he sees in the Oscar ceremony and this sort of push-pull between the really big commercial movies and then the traditional Oscar movies that we expect to win and get nominated, like Power of the Dog, is a bigger cultural trend about how movies are not as central to American culture nowadays. You know, people are broken down into streaming and peak TV and gaming and Twitter and um, all the different ways in which, you know, the little cell phones, all different ways in which we get entertained. And so movies don't have that same cultural significance anymore. Um, and it's a very uh, interesting argument. And, you know, as somebody who makes films, it is, it's a little terrifying sometimes to think about that. But of course, there are these other opportunities out there um, and, television for example and different ways to tell stories so it's something worth thinking about i think especially if you're sort of a younger filmmaker or somebody interested in visual storytelling think about like where are we going and what is what does this conflict in the academy actually mean for the sort of stories i want to tell i read that article on my way on the plane on the way to the oscars which is kind of a <laughs> <laughs> well i think if there's any hope for the future it is that the reaction has been so strong that maybe someone will go back to the beginning, as you suggested, Reno, or there'll be a creative idea about how to rethink this entire thing. I I don't have high hopes for that, but certainly there's room in this disaster for something better to come out of it on the other side. I hope so. I mean, they've been trying for years and they have been, I find it hard to believe that they can't come up with a way to do all 23 categories and still produce an entertaining show at the same time. Everybody I know that's ever tried to produce the show, it's an impossibility. It's really hard. You're trying to you're trying to please too many people. And it's like craft service. You can't you can't keep everybody happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watching but, it just made me happy that I was not one of the producers of the Oscar telecast because yeah. <laughs> it just looked so impossible. No, but, I can't imagine trying to do it. It's gotta be the most impossible task. Yeah. But there's gotta be a way to do it. You it's gotta be pulled back now at this point. And I think they will. Because I, I think they know that it was a bit of a disaster this year and that there was enough letters written and enough people resigned from the Academy that they realized that everybody was very upset. And it didn't even do well in the ratings, right? No, it, it did, I mean, it did better than worse. last year, but that was, that was going to happen regardless. Yeah. Well, it would be interesting to see if the Academy then 
reassesses their relationship with ABC and the producers and back to what the membership wants and how that, that can be fixed. And so there is some hope there. I, I will make one random prediction for next awards season. The Oscars telecast is pretty much a perennial nominee at the Directors Guild Variety Awards. I suspect that next year it will not be on the list. I suspect that the Oscars will not be uh, be recognized at the DGA uh, when we look back on this year. But hopefully we'll look back and be talking about a different ceremony. Sorry to have you revisit this, Reen. I know it was a bummer, but thank you for sharing your behind the scenes on this and Chris for breaking down and even though you didn't want to watch it watch it again to see see exactly what they did on that we'll call it a wrap guys great having you both here thanks a lot thank you thanks for having me listeners as I mentioned at the start these shorter episodes are new and I'd appreciate your feedback you can find my contact info at our website below the line one word dot biz that's b-i-z you also find past episodes and links to all of our social media so check it out thanks to Curtis Five for our music John Juan for our logo and all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Bowling Line. Rosie likes to be she likes to be part of I wish she could purr into the microphone. <laughs> she really does. She has a lot of opinions.